David Casson, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it's great to have you. Yeah, so obviously we go a little ways back. I've known you for a long time. I think I was first introduced to you 20 years ago at the Armory Show in Philadelphia. And I can't remember which gallery you were showing with there. Does that ring a bell to you? Uh, yeah, I think it was with Gallery Hanok. I think they had a booth. That's right. That, that's, uh, I think it was right near Drexel, I believe, out in Philly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the U.S. Artist Show, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what they called it. Something like that, yeah. yeah. Um, but I saw your work there, and I hadn't heard of you. I mean, this was 20 years ago, so you probably started just a year or two before that, right? Before that show? Well, 20 years ago? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it was in 2003, yeah, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, I started showing with the gallery that I was I actually recently just left them uh, about a year ago, but I was with them for 20 plus years. So, yeah, I started in 99. They took me on kind of as like a backroom artist, mm -hmm. like with just stuff that they would kind of show collectors every now and then. Never made it on the wall at all. And then uh, slowly kind of built up momentum with what I was doing. And uh, they finally put me on the wall, which is kind of awesome. And they started selling stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. 18, 1999, I would just moved to New York from Syracuse, where I went to college. And six months after I graduated, thank you, I um, luckily got into the gallery. Pretty, pretty awesome. Yeah, that is. So how did you get started in the, in the arts? Did you do it as a child? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, you know, like everybody, we drew in our notebooks during taking, take, instead of taking notes during school and yeah. stuff like that. So I used to draw, and that was kind of what I was had a natural inclination for like i had friends that were musicians and they just kind of gravitated towards music whereas i gravitated towards art so i'd have friends that would come over they'd play guitar and i'd just sit and draw them mm -hmm. or i'd be working on like an acrylic painting or something at the same time so it was kind of fun but just kind of that was kind of i guess what i kind of fell into as something i was interested in did you know that you would become an artist though or was it just a hobby you know, I really wanted to be an animator, actually, for Disney. That was like my first dream was um, we used to do trips to Disney World when I was a kid. And I'd be like, I'd always be like, this would be awesome to like work, work here, whatever that meant mm -hmm. at, <laughs> at, a, at a park or whatever and uh, and do drawings and, and do animations. And I was really into animation movies and all that stuff and bought all these books on it and ended up going to um my senior year in high school, I kind of got an oil paint set for the first time and kind of fell in love with oil painting versus animation versus hand-drawn stuff, like figure drawing and stuff like that. So it was uh, kind of that first oil painting I did just made me really fall in love with oil painting. So I kind of, kind of went in that direction a little bit. And that was it? No turning back from that point? Yeah, no, I went, I went to college for illustration. My dad wanted me to go for illustration because that's where you get a job. You know, a job. It's pretty funny. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that seems like a safe yeah. kind of job, job kind of thing that's within the arts that you can do. And you can do all different types of things. And you do learn a lot of skills, I think, that are, make you a better successful painter, I think, in my opinion. You know what I mean? Yeah. Doing illustration. So I did an illustration program at Syracuse. Um, originally took classes at University of the Arts in Philadelphia when I was about 15 years old. That's where I started figure drawing from life. And that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of charcoal studies and learning to like do master copies of paintings by flipping them upside down to see the abstract shapes and everything. And then first time I ever saw a nude woman was in my art class, which was crazy. It's at 15 years old <laughs> and she was talking to herself and it was really <laughs> weird. <laughs> I was like, this is really bizarre. Okay. <laughs> That's funny. So like, where were you raised? Mom. Uh, outside Philadelphia in, in oh. South Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like 10 minutes from Philly. And so all the, why did you all end up in Syracuse? Oh, I went to Syracuse. My dad went there and also my brother. So I have a brother that's 12 years older than me. And uh, I always looked up to him. And uh, he went to Syracuse and, for electrical engineering. And uh, we used to go visit him. He graduated in 86, I believe. And it was just amazing to go to, to the campus and see everything. And then my dad was in the military and he completed a master's degree there while he was serving in the military. Okay. So he went, so, so kind of got that in my blood. And I didn't really 
I looked at University of the Arts in Philadelphia because I was living near there. I kind of wanted someplace a little bit further away. And then I was also looking at SBA, uh, School of Visual Arts in New York City. And I just thought New York City was a little too big for me. And I thought Syracuse was like a nice small program that was nice for illustration. And then I really clicked with the professors that were also there. This guy, Robert Dacey, Bob Dacey, who's an amazing illustrator. And um, yeah, I figure, you know, it was weird. You know, you have that decision to make, like what art school do I go to when you're kind of in high school? And you're like, this is gonna affect the rest of my life. Should I go to Ringling, Florida? You know what I mean? Ringling School of Art and Design, or should I go to Syracuse, New York, where it's like winter all the time? versus mm -hmm. school that's right near the beach. Um, I thought Syracuse was great. I thought that I kind of got it in my head that an art school is really what I made out of it. So it was great. There was there was maybe the top 10% of the class that actually cared, which I noticed at most art schools. When I give lectures now at art schools, there's only like a small percentage of, of students that I feel like are going to be successful when they get out because they're the ones that are actually putting in the effort. And I figured if it was a smaller school, I could get more time from the professors because that's what I needed, you know? Hmm. Yeah, that's a lot of foresight for a teenager. I, I don't know that that would have occurred to me at 18 years old. Now that said, I don't think I learned as much as I wanted to <laughs> at Syracuse because I went to school, I moved to New York and went to school at the Art Students League. So that was kind of where I focused more on oil painting in general and figurative painting. Okay. So it was kind of, because the classes at Syracuse were like they're three and a half hours or four hours, maybe once per week. And then you get your assignment and you go home and you do that. And then you have, even with 21 credit hours, it's a lot of work because you're, you're doing other things, which are great. Like you're doing writing classes, you're doing philosophy. I took all my um, minor, all my um, general electives. Yeah. Well, generals and my electives were mostly in art history. So I'm about three credits shy of a minor in art history as well. Oh, wow. I love art history. And so I had that. And then I love the philosophy classes and the other history classes that were there, you know, at the school. At Being at a university that's known for way more than just art, it's not like liberal arts was just an add-on that was at another school that was attached to it, like maybe another art school. They had a really top-notch program and everything. So it was pretty, pretty awesome to go to a university then. You know, so it kind of rounded me out as a, as a human, <laughs> yeah. not just as an artist, you know, I could learn a lot that could feed my art. That's different than just, you know, if you're just digesting art, you're just going to, you're just going to kind of regurgitate stuff that's already been done. You know what I mean? Without yeah. a lot of thought that you put in things by reading philosophy and stuff. So you said it was great to go to a university then. Does that mean that you, you would do it differently if you went in 2022? No, I probably would do the same. Oh, I think I probably, I, I think, I think, you know, I don't think I ever wasted any time. I don't think I learned everything I wanted to learn there, but I still think that I learned enough that it wasn't wasted time. Okay. I think that anything I've done in my life hasn't been wasted because when I moved to New York City, I don't think I was the painter I wanted to be. And so I enrolled at the Art Students League to study more, to get better at figurative painting. And even the time I was working at a job doing graphic design and web development, that still made me the artist I am now because I'm interested in like grunge typography within my work and artists like David Carson and a lot of stuff like that, like Robert Rauschenberg, stuff that's not what every figurative painter would be interested in. And I think that comes into play with working with typography and design within stuff to make something that's a little bit different and kind of formalistic, you know, where it's just shapes to find out figure ground relationships and then and then adding a volumetric figure within there. So that's kind of fed into my graphic design background that I had for two years, kind of fed into what I, I love painting now. Oh, and it's perfect because you've got this figure behind you that oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost really like, <laughs> yeah, but it's like you're, it's like you're literally describing that painting as you're talking about your approach. Totally, yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's awesome. That's fitting. And, and then also just New York city with the graffiti on the walls and torn bills from, from, advertisements and layers of, of different strata of things that are going on. It's pretty, pretty awesome to have that kind of influence of living in that environment and having that affect your work as well. Yeah. And you, what's really cool is you kind of came across this look early. I mean, as far as I can tell, when I was first introduced to you, you were already doing this. 
which is pretty yeah, kind of took, pretty awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I took a little bit of a break because I've been painting Holocaust survivors, and I don't really do much to the backgrounds because I don't want to impose anything onto the pieces themselves. Right. And I want to have them kind of speak for themselves, as opposed to imposing, you know, like ideas I have about design and all that. The aspects of um, Things that I think capture the world today outside that are kind of interfering with what's going on with uh, like relationships and people and what we what we're having to go through with just everyday life nowadays, you know, mm -hmm. uh, into a into a painting in an abstract way. And I didn't think I wanted to do that with those pieces. So those pieces are a little bit more about just the sitter, yeah, not just nothing other than that. So. Yeah, and we're going to look at both of those. I hopefully on your website you've got some of your you do have some of your Holocaust, but hopefully we'll get to see some of the stuff like behind you as well. Um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure what's up there. It's been a while since I've checked the website. Yeah, I apologize. It'll, it'll be an adventure. None of us are updating our websites anymore. It seems like. Um, so, <laughs> how did you know to go from Syracuse to the Art Students League? And well, I mean, how did you navigate? that path and then which brought you eventually to gallery hennock in 99 yeah so um i moved two weeks after graduation to to brooklyn got a, a really cheap apartment with my then girlfriend um who she got a job at the guggenheim taking tickets i remember and i basically put my um i was working on websites when i was in college because i kind of wanted a skill that i could use to be more practical when I moved to New York. So I got, um, it was in the time of the uh, internet, like bubble, they call it like the dot com bubble. And so I was able to get a graphic design job pretty fast. Mm -hmm. And I actually was making pretty good money after two, two years. But um, after I was doing some illustration jobs every now and then I do, I did a few magazine covers. I did uh, some in like small, um, there's a magazine called Angels on Earth. And I did a few spot illustrations for them. And it didn't, because I kind of worked realistically, I was kind of almost a hired wrist for the art director in a way. And nowadays I think people could just do Photoshop, mm. whatever it was, and it would have been just as good as what I was spending hours painting, you know? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't really, I was that fulfilled as a painter. And they were also kind of smaller pieces that were, weren't very um, mature, you know, like kind of what I think about is, as something that's a real piece of art that you would hang on your wall. It was more just like little studies on illustration board type of stuff. Um, how did I navigate that? So then I, I did that for about two years. And then I was after um, I started taking classes at the Art Students League and the National Academy of Design, which was on the Upper East Side. Uh, I don't think it's around anymore, unfortunately. I think there's still a museum there. And I think that they still have National Academicians, which is kind of a designation for the National Academy that was around since, I don't know, like the 1840s, probably. Hmm a really old New York institution that's on Museum Mile, not that far from, again, it's across the street from the Guggenheim and maybe like five blocks, six blocks from the, from the Metropolitan. The, um, anyway, I studied there, which is kind of really small classes. And then uh, I did that part-time while I worked. And the, uh, let's see what happened. Oh, and, and this is because you a had a time. goal to become a painter? That's why you well, moved into this? Yeah, I was... Yeah, I was already in the Gallery Hennock. Oh, okay. I was already in um, in 99. So this was about 2000, late 2000, 2001. Okay. I started taking classes there because I was I was in the gallery, but I wasn't like really on the walls, you know? So, and I wasn't really fulfilled at what I was doing. I was doing landscape paintings that the gallery kind of took on and they were more city cityscape paintings, almost like Richard Estes style, almost kind of photorealism, almost like just illustrations of the city that weren't really that great. Um, didn't feel fulfilled, didn't want that to be my life as a painter. I thought I could do more. And so I wanted to go back and, and learn painting from life. And so I did night classes at the National Academy and the, and the Art Students League. And that turned into day classes, unfortunately, after 9-11. And my company, I was at a dot-com at the time. I was a creative director for the entire dot-com, which is pretty awesome. They lost their funding because of 9-11. They were on 14th Street though, and the, the investors were from, I think they were outside of the United States and they thought that 14th Street was right near where World Trade Center was. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they were they cut their funding. And so they the company downsized from 
the 65 people that were there down to about seven people. And so my whole team got all laid off, which was actually a blessing in disguise because I was able to use the unemployment insurance that I had, go back to the Art Students League full time. Wow. So basically living off of, I think, $300 a month or something. And In New um, York City? Well, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, which is South Brooklyn. Okay. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a hike, maybe 35 minutes out of out of lower Manhattan, depending on the trains and that, the train situation. So I would I would um, train in and out of the Art Students League every day. And I would do classes actually at the National Academy in the morning. And then I would go to the Art Students League in the afternoon and also the LPM class. So I didn't have a kid at all. So I was kind of didn't have a lot of responsibilities, which was a great time to really get in a lot of study. So that was around 2000, end of 2001. When I started that, up until I literally would, was still still there, up until 2006, and oh. 2007 was my last. I did night classes in 2007. So 2006 was when my son was born, uh, Lucas, and I was a stay-at-home dad after that. So I was a guy that was at the league, studying for about nine hours a day, uh, Monday through Friday, and wow. I was a guy that only wanted to work from life until I had a son and had responsibility and I had to like, oh, how am I going to be able to paint in my studio in Brooklyn with a kid at my feet? You know what I mean? So I learned how to be a better photographer <laughs> so that I could take photos so that they could kind of be as if I was working from life, you know, started in integrating more pieces that had, again, the backgrounds I wanted to do. It wasn't just a model in the studio. It was more um, figurative work that that kind of had a message uh, more so than than just a, a sitter in front of you kind of thing. So like I kind of life has kind of given you challenges, you know, you, you kind of use those and incorporate them so that you're the sum, you're the artist that's the sum of those experiences in what you do. And so that's kind of what I've been trying to do pretty much my whole career. So far. My career. That sounds so weird, man. We're not that old, are we? I know. Isn't that strange? I know. Every time I interview someone close to my age and say 20 years, it kind of throws me back. It's crazy. Um, yeah. So is there someone at the Art Students League or one of these other places that you took classes that influenced the way you paint? Because I've noticed that, well, let's put it this way. I've never met anyone else who paints quite like you, who has quite the same approach that, that you haven't, it, that hasn't come from you, that hasn't been influenced by you. So is there someone that kind of sent you in that direction or several people? I mean, how did you end up painting the way you paint? And I want to talk more specifically what I mean by that, but I start with a broad yeah, no, question. I, think, I, think, I mean, I think that's a huge compliment. First off, I appreciate it, I think. No, it's it is a compliment. Like... <laughs> if I didn't like you, if I didn't love Thank your work, God. I wouldn't be interviewing you. <laughs> Yeah, Huge that, fan um, here. Thanks. Uh, no, I think that, um, well, so I studied with uh, mostly Harvey Dinnerstein at the league, ah. who, who recently passed away, which is really sad. Um, and I was a huge fan when I moved to New York, I was a huge fan of the, uh, so this illustration kind of bridge, right? So my professor, I got really sick when I was in college, uh, had to withdraw for my, the end of my sophomore year like the last three months of my sophomore year, I was kind of in and out of the hospital and stuff. Um, and I had a professor that, professors that I worked really hard with and, and, and knew really well and became friends with that they would bring me books to read. And so wow. one of my professors brought me The Art Spirit by Robert Henry. And then while I was kind of couldn't be painting, I was just devouring books on the Ashcan School. And so falling in love with New York City through their eyes and that kind of gritty realism Type of thing really really spoke to me and i and i thought about how harvey dinnerstein and burton silverman and, and kind of those guys that and i think they called them themselves the davis gallery group uh, max ginsburg uh those new york old new york jews i guess mm -hmm. right <laughs> that all kind of came from uh rafael moses sawyer who had studied with robert henry you know so you have that kind of influence of and also the art students league being this historic place where all everybody kind of studied, like John Sloan, Robert Henry, um, and also Robert Henry being from Philadelphia originally. Well, 
he has an interesting story. It's pretty crazy. I don't know if you know his whole history mm -hmm. of being in Nebraska, moving to Atlantic City, and then being in Philadelphia, New York, and then you know Paris and Ireland and all that stuff. It's an amazing life story. I recommend everyone read about him, not just his uh, the Ark Spirit, but his biography and everything. But um, yeah, so I just love those guys' paintings so much, and and fell in love with Harvey Dinnerstein. Um, Max Ginsburg, the first painting I saw of his was of a union meeting that was at a gallery called Bread and Roses Gallery that's uh, operated by a, a union. Uh, the uh, I think it's 11 SEIU, I think is the, the initials. I'm sure, I think it's 11 something. I forget the union in New York City that's like a workers union. And he had a painting up in their gallery that just blew my mind. Hmm. From the 60s, I believe, Harvey, or uh, Max Ginsburg. And so I never knew who Max was at that time. And I kind of seeked out these um, mentors in a way. Mentors just through their art. You know, I didn't right. really know Max that well until maybe 15 years ago, you know. So, and then Harvey I studied with, he was amazing. Uh, his class was impossible to get into. And when I finally got in, you know, you stick in the class so you don't lose your spot. Um, the league is you pay per month. I don't know if everyone knows that. It's like not a class where you enroll for like a semester. It's uh, it's month by month, and there's people that have been in those classes. I think since the 70s, maybe wow. the 60s. Just they don't they don't want to give up their spot. Yeah, that and it's just it's addicting. You know, you go to you don't. There's a lot of thinking involved, but there's not a lot of thinking involved. You know, what I mean, you're basically you're painting whatever the monitors in the class put in front of you to paint, and also wherever you luckily get a spot in the classroom because they usually do it by random draw you know, where your, your spot is. And I was addicted to that for five and a half, six years, you know, just working from life doing that. And it's, it's, it's great training. It felt like it was a, a bottleneck in a way where I was really poor um, going through that. But then I gained the skills, I think, that come out of the bottle, you know, with something that was kind of, I could commercialize or make money on, you know what I mean? Or something, I could do the paintings that have been in my head for so long. But so I'm trying to picture these, you say they're a class, but then you said monitors. So was this in more of an open figure session or was Harvey Dinnerstein actually walking around critiquing and demoing? Yeah. So the way the Art Students League works is that the teacher, it's a five day week class, their afternoon class and the morning class, three hours. There's two monitors usually that call, that come in, set up all the easels based on the tapes of wherever your, your spot is. They always, they always kind of, they work with the teacher to set the poses. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to be a monitor also at the National Academy for a teacher out there at the National Academy. And uh, that way I got the class for free, which was awesome. Yeah. So I used to cut corners and get scholarships at the exhibitions that they'd have and all that stuff. The um, the Art Students League actually bought one of my paintings once. Really Whoa, bad that's stuff, cool. <laughs> I don't know. It ends up on the wall every now and then I'm like cringing. Oh like, yeah, anyway, there's always. That's, uh, <laughs> like I saw your painting. Pros and cons to selling a painting early, painting. right? It's it's it was awesome though. You know yeah. what I mean? But um, not my computers. Oh, okay, sorry. That's all right. Low battery warning. Um, the uh, no, but the league was was pretty awesome. It seemed like it was just such a welcoming environment to be able to go there, and you literally just you put your your paints down and just paint what's in front of you. And so anyway, Harvey would come in on Mondays, I think, and Wednesdays or Monday and Thursday, and he would go around and critique everybody. Sometimes you'd only get 30 seconds of time with him. Sometimes it'd be like 10 minutes, you know, so it was like individual coaching for those three hours. And then you wouldn't see him again until Thursday, which actually is not bad because then you get a chance to really kind of develop on your own. I yeah. feel like it's almost like the league is like an a la carte kind of teaching place where you can take the ingredients from different instructors and make that into your own soup of who you want to be. You know, so I, I really hate dogmatic things that people tell artists to do. Like, you know, there's so many things that are told to artists that kind of make them all paint the same way mm -hmm. as opposed to painting what their temperament is. And so my temperament is very much on, on the terms of, of an Anagoni uh painter or if you know anagoni petro anagoni mm -mm. um wyeth those guys but with oil paint yeah so i don't mind using a small brush to describe broken color within a painting i'm not uh an ala prima 
I'm not a like a person who follows Schmidt so much. I like what he says about things, but it's his philosophy of how he paints and why he paints is so different than what I feel as an artist of what I want to do. Mm-hmm. You know, I still respect him and I still respect artists that paint way differently. And some I don't understand how they paint and it just blows my mind. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like totally. I don't know how Schmidt does paintings and like that's amazing. But that's Schmidt, you know. Uh I don't want to be a copy of that guy, you know? Or and it's not even a conscious thing. But you 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 probably know this. You could tell where people studied. I could tell someone and it is splitting hairs. Because I think about this within music. I'm like, I don't know if I could tell a musician's influences, but I can tell an artist's influences. Like if they went to a certain school um, in New York mm-hmm. versus Florence, you mm-hmm. know what I mean? You can, you can almost like, you can split those hairs because it's something that we're in tune with, with the type of mark making or uh, the color palette, or it's, there's telltale signs of people that studied with Nelson Shanks, for instance, right. or, or people that studied with Schmidt. Right. You know, so it's uh, it's it's pretty interesting. I don't think I ever fell into. And my whole thing is also that the artists that I love, I think I think more about their philosophy as to what they paint and how they see as opposed to how they put marks down on a piece of paper or on a on a panel. For instance, I'm a huge Antonio Lopez Garcia fan. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't want to paint like him at all. I think he's amazing, but I'm more in tune with kind of that he took 10 years to do a painting. You know, that blows my mind that he can paint something so real and honest and truthful within his work. That speaks to me when I want to paint something representationally. That's what I want to capture. You know, when I, when I paint um, like someone's hands, I want that to be as if it's like a Antonio Lopez looking out, painting a landscape, capturing the authenticity of that, of that person or that place, you know? Yeah. That's kind of what I look for an artist. Cause I don't, I always, always always say that I don't actually love, and I don't love every artist's work completely. I'm sure you don't, you know what I mean? But I think that at the end of my journey, I want to be the artist that I love. And yeah. that's taking from all, that's taking all those ingredients I love from so many different artists and then combining them into who I want to be. So that I can eventually love my work because as artists, we're so like self deprecating. Yeah. I think, you know, I mean, we're always putting ourselves down to make ourselves better. You know, this idea of kind of like you have to break the muscle to build it in a way uh, and nitpicking every little thing that we do, that there has to be some self love as well that we need to have, you know, in, in those tiny successes on the journey. I mean, but then also being an artist is so, um, selfish in general you know we're doing this to kind of see the world in our way and get our uh intangibles out of our head onto something you know that we have that therapy where we can really approach a painting and like this painting i'm working on behind me of my wife i've had in my head for like 10 years this idea of the figure floating in this kind of space with the letter forms i want to have and so it's awesome to be able to get that out. You know, it's going to take five months to do because I work on other things at, at different times and whatever, but that's so self gratifying, you know? Yeah. So, how do you, that, that statement you said about being the artist you love eventually, do you think that's really possible? Because you also said um, that artists are self deprecating. And uh, that's that can be a good thing. Well, I'm paraphrasing, but that can be a good thing because that's how we learn. We kind of, right? I mean, I, I think that's what you were saying. Yeah, then, yeah. No, I think I don't think it's. I mean, we're self-critical. I guess we're always self-critical. You have to be. Right. So, if how you do you love yourself? How do you how do you become the artist you love, and still become self-critical enough to continue to grow? That's the struggle I'm, just, I'm, <laughs> I'm Yeah, no, I think, I think that's just big picture and small picture. I think that holistically, I love my work. You okay. know what I mean? I don't want to live with my work. <laughs> Me neither. You know, I, don't, I want to go off and, and be in other places and, and have other people hopefully enjoy it. You know what I mean? I'm the worst towards my paintings because for me, painting, and this is, I think, where you can kind of come to it, is that painting isn't, you're not producing a product. You're creating an experience for yourself to be in in that moment. So this painting for me is 
I want to make this painting the best painting I can do at this time in my life. You know, and, and yes, I'll see it a year from now and be like, that finger is way off, or this color is bad, or this needs to be better melded, or this shadow could be better, you know, and all that stuff. But then in the moment right now, it's like reading a great book. It's something I don't want to finish. You know, I could work on it for another six months or a year, you know, all like just keeping attacking it and, and being part of this good story that I'm reading or this part of my life that I'm experiencing right now. Cause I'm sure you have paintings that you remember what was going on in the news or in your life as you were doing that painting. So that's kind of how artists I feel we mark these paintings are memories for ourselves as what, and I think that's the more important thing that kind of gets locked in your head versus creating a product. Granted, we all need to survive and sell stuff, you know what I mean, to pay our bills. But the idea of having a purity to what it is that we're doing in the moment, uh, I think is way more important than, than just um, being a machine whipping out paintings. Right. So just to clarify, you said that you couldn't live with your paintings, and I said me neither, but I was referring to my own paintings because I'd kill to live with one of your paintings. <laughs> Yeah, no, no I'd love to do that. Trick. Yeah, we have to do that sometimes. I love your pieces too, obviously. Um, <laughs> we talked about it. Well, yeah, so I, I still want to talk a little bit more about that, though. So how, you know, how you, how do you love who you are as an artist, but still be self-critical? I mean, have you arrived at that point where you love what you do? Not love what you do as far as love your day-to-day -day activities, but you love yeah. your work. And yet, because you're clearly self-critical, because um, I've talked yeah, to you before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but do you love what you yeah, do? Yeah, no, I, think, I think I could be a way better painter. Way better yeah. painter. Way, way better painter. You know what I mean? Yeah. But when I'm in, I think that I'm, I'm able to send the message that I that I, I want to send with a lot of the pieces, a lot of the survivor paintings. Sometimes I feel a little off. Sometimes I feel like I hit it. You know what I mean? It's kind of... um. Yeah, it's, I don't think you're going to love everything you do, but I think that there are going to be moments that make it worth it. Okay. You know? I think there's pieces I have that I'm like, yeah, I think, I think that's, I can live with that. That's a good one. You okay. know, this one, maybe not. This one was a huge failure that took me a long time. I have a couple pieces like that, that I had best intentions for in the beginning and they had this energy and then they just kind of stuck around the studio and then Shana had to deal with me being miserable. You know what I mean? But other pieces make up for that, I think. So, I mean, yeah, there's definitely endorphins that happen where I love waking up in the mornings. Like this morning I got up, I couldn't sleep. So I got up at like 3.30. What? Kind of looked at my phone, which is like the worst thing. And then I got up, I was like, ah, I'm gonna go paint. So I got up at 4 a.m. and just went to the studio because we have a little home studio that we're in right now. My wife is literally right there painting mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's the same way. She gets up at like 5 a.m. sometimes to go paint, you know, wow. because it's quiet. You know, I used to stay up all night and paint. Now I get up early and I paint and we shut it down at dinner time and, and we spend time together every night. So that's kind of our routine. But I'm so excited about everything I do. I'm sure you are too, you know, and I wouldn't do anything that I wasn't excited about. I think that's also a thing that's key. Like I'm not painting portrait commissions that I don't want to do. You know, I do very rare commissions and a lot of times it's only stuff I want to do. Granted, I'm poorer for it financially, but I'm richer for it in what I'm doing, you know, and, and, and how I love what I do. So is it, I've often described to people this kind of contradiction or dichotomy that I have in my life where I see myself as extremely confident and yet extremely um, hard on myself. So like, I know what I'm capable of, but I'm never satisfied. And it seems like a contradiction. Um, is that what you're talking about where you've accepted that you, you're a capable artist, like you do, you, you make good art, but yet, and when the individual paintings come out, you know, that you could improve from painting to painting and you know that you need to improve. I think if, you want that though to yeah. to love yourself, would you? Like, yeah, you but you're not always there. If you just do the painting; it was like perfectly in your vision. You'd just be done. <laughs> I think that also. I think I think for myself, I'm I'm extremely insecure in a lot of aspects of painting. Like extremely insecure. I'm extremely confident in my work. Uh, how much work I'll put into something. 
I'm extremely confident in my work ethic to figure it out, be able to make it happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, extremely insecure. So I think that I learned luckily early on to embrace that insecurity. And also to not, um, I think what's another thing that's really bad is when artists compare themselves to other artists, yeah. especially with Instagram. Like I'm blown away by the stuff that my friends and peers do all the time. Yeah. And that's just, it's, that could be a negative thing or it can be a positive thing where you're like, like, yeah, that's awesome. That's a human being who did that. And I know that guy, that guy's not that smart. No, I'm just kidding. You know what I mean? Like, you could do that. I could figure that out. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's, there's hope. There's always hope on that horizon that you're going to get even better than you already are. Well, so you don't want to, you'd be at the end of your journey, man. If you like, just did it and you're you're completely satisfied and it was the most amazing painting and everyone get through roses at your feet for it you know what i mean oh totally just, okay, what do i do now well and what you just said is exactly what i was trying to say when you look at another artist there's two ways of looking at that you look at another artist that just blows your mind there's two ways you could look at that you could go man that person is painting paintings that just make me want to shut down and give up or you can have say wait that's a human. I'm a human. If that was done by a human, I can figure that out. And that's what I mean by the confidence where it's like, yeah, I recognize I'm not there yet, but I, but I believe in myself enough that if I, that I can work hard enough and, and eventually get there. Right. And that's, but they're, but they're yeah. like, there are pieces that just might not be in you. That's, like, okay. That's so true. I think you interviewed, you interviewed Mario Robinson and, and yeah, I am, like blown away constantly by this piece that he did of a church interior. Yeah. That wouldn't have, that painting would not have been in me. I'm so stoked. I got to see that painting just on his social media. I haven't seen it in person, but it blows me away. There's presence in that piece. You know what I mean? And I'm just, I'm like that, that enriches my day. That yeah. makes me a lover of art. Just being like Mario, just go do more of those paintings, man. That was, that blew my mind. You know what I mean? And so, for me, I want to be a cheerleader of all of these artists that I love, you yeah. know, because I want to see great art first and foremost, because that's going to influence me. Not, uh, again, maybe selfishly, because I'm like, I want to see it. I want to see, I want to see Jeff's amazing paintings. You know what I mean? I want to see your paintings in person. So I see that texture, you know, and I can learn from that, you know, but still that those paintings aren't in me. They're in you there. It's, we're so much the sum of, how we, all of us individually grew up, our backgrounds, everything we believe in, you know, mm -hmm. who we've studied with. It's, um, it's incredible. Yeah. Do you find that's, Oh, that's, that's really quick. So that's also why, like when things get dogmatic, it's almost like you're, you're cookie cuttering artists and then they lose who they actually are. They're not, sometimes artists unfortunately can't be strong enough to be able to say, I want to use a small brush versus a large brush, or I want to use this medium versus this medium. Or I think this should be blue and this, you're telling me it should be this three colors only. You know what I mean? I feel like sometimes an atelier program can kind of wipe out the individuality of an artist, you know, and, and through dogmatic means. And I think that that's something that's bad. Yeah. You know, I interviewed Todd Case here. Are you familiar with his work? Yeah, I love it. Yeah. yeah. And he, he's a great guy too. Um, but he talked about how he actually studied with Max Ginsburg, who we both know is a great guy, but Max, Max is a, he's a strong personality, right? And he used to tell Todd Casey that big men use big brushes or big artists use big brushes. And, uh, but Todd Casey paints with his tiny little brush and Todd would say, he told me, he's like, but I was six foot one and I'm using this tiny brush and he's like five, two on a, on, when he's wearing, <laughs> wearing big shoes, right? And he's, and he's telling me that big men or big artists use big brushes. But he also said that if he could hide from him long enough for him to see a finished painting, then Max would pat him on the back and be like, nice job. But if he came too early and saw him using a small brush, he'd be like, put that thing away. <laughs> but it's just, it, you, it just, you know, it reminded me of that because that, that idea of that, this being dogmatic and how it, it is kind of dangerous because you, like Todd Casey, have this certain temperament where you just want to get down, down into it, like really get close to the painting and, and work it. Um, and there is a risk with dogmatic teachers of stripping that from a student. 
if they're I, I do understand the basics though you know like that large to small and yeah. when i like so I do a lot of prep drawings that are all like the large block shapes that kind of whittle down and i understand where you would want a student i guess to to start that way you don't want them to start in the eye and then work out yeah and he I've explained that of course totally, right totally totally you know but i think that i mean i think that color palettes can kind of I think I want artists just going to hold on to who they are and why they started and hold on to their temperament and move around that way. I think that's what kind of led me. And also, I think I'm a little bit stubborn in some ways that might be good and also might be bad. You know what I mean? I think we, again, that's a temperament I have. And so I wouldn't, I'd listen like with half an ear open. I don't know. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> I'd be like, that's funny, Max. That's a good joke. That's what I say. <laughs> I painted with Max before, and I wanted to, I wanted to learn a la prima, be a better a la prima painter because I'm not an a la prima guy. Can't do right. crap in like two and a half hours. Uh, and he'd be, I'd be painting alongside him he, the whole time. He'd just tell me I'm just doing it wrong. And I'm like, that's cool, <laughs> whole time. But it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> that's pretty funny. Okay, well let's let's pull up some of your work because I want to talk about how you paint. That's, um. When do I get to undrape? I'm looking at the logo in it's, the corner. It's a metaphor, man. You're gonna, <laughs> but if you want, <laughs> you're going to just, I want you to share all of your deepest, darkest secrets with me. And if you want to do it naked, that's fine too. Um, all right. So let's start with your beautiful wife, Shayna, who is also an artist and just to, on the other side of the room, as you mentioned. Um, yeah. But I wish I could zoom in on this. I think you can click on it. Can you? Oh, I mean, yeah, it helps. Not perfect, a but little bit a little bit bigger. But what it is about your work that I find so interesting and is, is just the hatching that you do. It's almost like you've turned a brush into a pencil. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you paint in the way that actually you paint like a lot of us draw. But the other thing about it, and I want you to comment on both of these things, um, is there's a huge, this, this huge um, kick of photorealism right now, especially with Instagram. It's like, if you're a photorealist, you're the most popular guy on the web. And, oh, and you gotta have honey dripping down your face too. That true, <laughs> that too. Yeah. But <laughs> you have this level of realism that, gets is so lifelike you could touch it and and, and like pushes the boundaries of photorealism without hitting it and i don't know what it is you're doing to where it looks so unbelievably refined and yet never quite looks like a photo i won't and oh cool so tell me a little bit about that can you explain why or is that far too complex like what is it that you're doing that these other photorealists aren't doing well i don't i don't well i think working at the art students league only from life that definitely helps so i definitely edit a lot of the references i use so i don't paint i'm not painting verbatim the photo reference because i don't want those edges i want edges that are based on you know like you could the edge of a slope and how the distance is and if it's a obtuse slope going into the distance it's a slower, softer edge versus like the nodes, which would be a harder edge in profile, like in this piece. Hmm. So I, I think about the edge condition on how it affects the background. That's really important. And so like the last 25% of the painting, usually I throw the reference away and I just think through the painting. I think, are the hand, do I see all the fingers? Are they make, do they all make sense? You know what I mean? Like yeah. the idea is that you want, you, I'm not just a machine just painting verbatim from the photography. I think maybe that's what they do. I'm not, I'm, I hate being called a photorealist. Oh, yeah, well, I wouldn't call you that. I think that there's like, I feel like the brain kind of shuts off if you're a photorealist and the photo kind of takes over. You know what I mean? The photo is telling you what to paint versus the other way around. You're not enforcing your will over top of the photograph to, to get what you want. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this piece, I mean, this was a demo painting for a workshop. And uh, so this was done in one week in front of students. You know, I never took, I, well, no, no, this was, this was, uh, because we've been teaching online. Oh, so I started oh. filming all of my demos, uh, 
at our other studio, I have cameras and everything set up. And I would, um, it's funny, I never took track of, I never kept track of how long a painting takes ever. Because I'll have them for years in the studio, just on the floor yeah. or whatever. So you can see, I don't know if the camera, there's a, there's another demo that I'm, I have to still have to finish up awesome. right on my guitar uh, that um, the collector bought like six months ago and I haven't finished it yet for him because I want to make it better. I'm like, I can make this better for <laughs> you. So just be patient. Thanks. The guy's awesome. Uh, anyway, the, um, yeah, so I've learned that I actually paint. The actual time that the brush is touching the canvas is a lot less than I thought it was because <laughs> I'm sitting back thinking about and I don't record my sitting back to think about how this edge is messed up or, you know, I have my coffee in the morning and I'm looking at what it is I want to tackle that day or where like this edge is really messed up or this need this transition needs to be more subtle. And, you know, edges are all like it's a squinting game where you have to squint to see what it disappears to kind of what you need to massage and all that stuff. You don't get that when you record a video. Right. You know, that cold video I recorded some time ago, I think it was a 23 hour painting and I, I condensed it down to six hours by only recording every brush stroke, but taking out all the breaks and stepping back, yeah. the thinking, you know, the mixing the paint, but the brush strokes equated to six hours, which I found really interesting. But um, no, I love that video. I oh, still don't you. understand how you painted it. How? Because you paint and then you try to destroy your mark. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting, you want to have this fight with yourself when you paint, it seems. Yeah, I don't know. I'm a conflicted artist. That's a whole topic. <laughs> it's on. But um, let's look at some more of these. Okay, so this is Aunt Dale, 72 inches long. It's, um, I assume you're Aunt Dale, laying sideways yeah. on a table? Or yeah, a so she has Tarlox cysts. So she has like a condition that makes her really uncomfortable. Oh, for, that's for sitting. so sad. Yeah, so, so all my paintings are life-size. And I, I paint a lot of family members because I'm always trying to, there are people I want to spend time with, but I can't. Um, and so doing these paintings, like the painting of Shana, although I spend a lot of time with her, uh, I would paint my mom a lot, um, my dad, my aunt. My aunt was like a, almost an, another mother in a way, very big supporter of me when I was uh, growing up with art supplies and everything. And she really believed in me and she's incredible. And so she came down with this Tarlov sis kind of thing where she couldn't get comfortable at all. And I thought it was really interesting. She's really kind of kind of frail, but also really strong. Like she's really strong personality but uh, her body doesn't show that. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting kind of juxtaposition. And I wanted to put her in a position that was kind of um, off kilter a little bit. So you kind of see how like the, the bones are stacked on top of each other. And it was kind of about a, the anatomy, but then also if you could zoom in on the hands, I wish you could. Oh, I wish and, I could. Uh, from the color. Um, it's so much, it was, it's so much like kind of a fun painting to do in a way. Uh, for me and, and just really to get at her, 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 um, her going through this pain in a way, but then in a piece that she still is, um, looking at slightly smiling. It's, it's interesting. Cause she, she's like this face for the family in a mm -hmm. way where she's like the empathetic one that sends cards to everybody. She sends cards to my ex-wife so, hmm. you know, is my ex-wife is still part of the family. So she's like this kind of, um, empath kind of person where mm -hmm. she feel, takes everybody's pain and kind of, yeah. Yeah. She's an interesting girl. And I painted her a lot uh, early on. I just found her so fascinating. And she'd be the one that would visit me. She actually visited my son more than uh, my parents ever visited my son. Wow, she sounds girl. amazing. She's you know, pretty incredible. She lives in New York right now. Or actually, she lives in Florida right now. She's taking care of my uncle, her brother, who's uh, has, who's going through some hard times right now. So she like is the one who goes to help everyone in the family. Wow. You know, the thing I notice about it, well, first of all, this idea of the stacking bones, you know, just like she's almost like caving in on herself. You totally, at least that's how it feels to me. It totally works. But also, man, the way you describe anatomy is unbelievable. Like those legs, those thighs, they look almost sinuous through the skin. Thanks. Just, I wish, uh, yeah, I wish I had more time on this piece. Actually, this is 
Um, it was in New York. At the gallery hated the painting, of course. Why? <laughs> um, I don't, they just they didn't really. We didn't really vibe together towards the end. But, oh. <laughs> Um, I actually have this in my garage and I want to, I want to, I want to bring it back out and work on it some more. You still own this painting? You didn't sell it? No, this one's in my, in my, uh, my garage. Yeah. Oh, what a waste, man. That's a gorgeous painting. I had the experience. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'm sure someone will buy it someday. That's beautiful. Um, I'm not even sure what's even on here. Oh, okay, so this okay. is one of the survivors. Yeah, tell me about this survivor series. So this is uh, Louise and Lazar Farkas. They're some, yeah. they're Holocaust survivors. So tell us about this whole project. The whole project. Well, I mean, wow. yeah, okay. not, yeah. Why did you do it? I mean, what or, what motivated this, it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, about eight years ago now, I, I got asked by a collector, an Israeli collector to paint his mother-in-law. And I was, I was being kind of polite and being like, well, you know, I appreciate that you like my work and I'm, I really don't do commissions at all. And he said, um, well, you know, she's special. You might want to paint her. She's actually a survivor of the Shoah, of the Holocaust. And I was like, yeah, I'll paint her. Huh. Like, I, I, want, I want to make a painting. It's not a commission. I told him, I was like, I want to just paint her Whatever I paint, you have the option to purchase if you want. Um, I want to meet with her. I'd love to talk to her for a few hours, hear her story, her testimony. Um, early on, I, I studied with a, a, a teacher in at the Art Students League in New York that would, if she did do a portrait commission, she would actually spend a day or two with the sitter, just getting to know them. And for some reason, that kind of rubbed off on me. In a way, I was like, this is the best way to get to know somebody and, and do a painting that you care about is to actually care about the subject. And so I said, I would love to actually film her testimony, have a videographer. At that time, I had done a video on uh, where I painted Jace, who was uh, uh, one of my instructional DVD videos, was Jace. And in the video, every hour, we kind of cut to her story, an interview with her. So that you're not just painting a person or like a like an object in front of you, like just a portrait. It, you're learning about Jace. You know, you're learning how crazy and quirky she is, and she went and lived in Paris and became a mime and all this other stuff. You're learning about what she, how she grew up, and so it makes it gives it a little bit more. It gives the painting voice, I feel, and so that having that kind of having a testimony interview with the piece gives the painting. Uh, some type of sound aspect where you can hear the hear the sitter. Can you imagine hearing some of the, the Rembrandt portraits? Speak? I know. I think about that Those a lot. Voice sound. Yeah. That's what I want to capture. What was and her day-to-day so day day like? Yeah. I, I'm so curious about that. Some of those women that look like they're so puckered up. Mm -hmm. You're like, what is your, like, are you, you have to go out and milk the cows every morning? And like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? Or, or do you live in a castle or, or whatever? I always thought it was really interesting. Like, imagine uh, meeting Baltazar Castellon, like the painting yeah. that Raphael did. Like, it'd be awesome, you know, just to hear his voice. I bet it was really high pitched, his voice. <laughs> yeah, I wonder. Um, <laughs> you know? Um, anyway, so then, uh, so he went to, to his mother in law, showed her my work, and she didn't want to be painted by me. She didn't like my work at all. He was like, oh, this is nice, but, I don't. and so, I had just been teaching in Israel about two weeks prior to that whole thing going on. And I had a student come visit me from Israel, this woman, Terry, uh, Terry Hirsch, who came to visit me in Brooklyn. And I was telling her the story about, you know, I could have had this, this cool painting project and it kind of fell through. And she's like, well, you know, my parents are both survivors and they live in New Jersey. Well, she's like, her parents are separated. She says that her uh, said that her dad lived in Fort Lee, New Jersey, and that her mom lives with her sister, who were both hidden children during the Holocaust in uh, Queens, in Forest Hills. And she's like, I could call them up. I'm sure they'd want to pose for you. Which I was like, this is awesome. Let me do this. You know, this is like a cool, worthy project. To to, it wasn't even a project at first. It was like, let me do one painting of Sam, Sam Godofsky. And uh, he was the first in, in the series. And then I kind of went from the next. I painted his, his ex-wife and hit her fraternal twin sister. At the, and I painted them together. And then I painted, being in Albuquerque, I posted about my paintings. And then 
Shana was waiting in line at Whole Foods and a woman that lives here in Albuquerque, uh, who Shana used to buy clothing from, she used to own a boutique downtown, this woman, Elsa Ross, kind of stopped Shana at the Whole Foods and was like, hey, I've, I've seen your, your boyfriend's paintings and I love them. Like I, he's painting survivors. And she's like, I don't tell anybody this, but I'm a survivor. And so she Whoa. actually survived uh, Warsaw, the Warsaw ghetto, smuggled out of a workman's truck when she was five years old. And Elsa, I was like, I'll paint Elsa. She lives here in Albuquerque. You know, I had just kind of been going back and forth between New York and Albuquerque at that time. And Elsa's amazing. She's become like another grandmother, you know? I just hmm. talked to her on the phone two days ago. And I'm trying to get to Houston right now to paint her again, because the first painting I did of her was okay. I think I want to do a better painting, because now I know her better than I did then. So I know more of her personality, and I'm going to do a bigger painting, like something that's pretty intense. Um, <laughs> which is going to be, I think, a lot, a lot more, like, I think I did an okay piece, you know, like you're saying, you can do better. I yeah, want to, totally. Now that I know this person after five or six years, seven years, and have gone out to dinners and lunches and brunches with her, you know, get to, I know her better and I want to paint her better. So what is she know? like so, in her late eighties now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She was five. So in like 40, 42, 43. I believe, hmm. maybe even earlier, right earlier, but she never saw her parents again. She was really, she's amazing. She's pretty like empathic. Like she saw a painting I did, recently did. My mom recently passed away a few months ago. Oh, I'm and sorry. I did a painting in my mom's hands. Thanks. Uh, painting in my mom's hands and my hands and I posted it and she's like, she called me up and she said, I was thinking about you, you're an orphan now. And I'm like, Elsa, that's, that's so sweet. Like you've been an orphan since you were five years old and you're thinking about me being an orphan. Like that was so heartfelt. And I'm just like, there's no comparison at all. You know, I was lucky to have a, have my mom for a long time, you know what I mean? And have a, not the best relationship, but you know, and, uh, and to do a painting of that, again, that experience of doing the piece, um, it brought me back to thinking about my relationship with my mom and, and to have Elsa come and like comfort me in a way like that was really sweet. Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just kind of been doing these pieces that kind of bounce from one to another. And then, um, this was, uh, so Luis and Lazar is, uh, my mother-in-law's friends, Shirley and Jeff Shirley's, they live in Austin now, but they're from Queens and this is Shirley's parents who are both survivors that lived in Forest or not Forest Queens. They were just in Queens. I'm not sure the area is that Queens, I forget. Queens is huge. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, and Lazar owned a grocery in Queens and uh, his wife, Luis, uh, was always by his side. They have a really interesting relationship because, so sometimes I can sneak in some abstraction that kind of means something within a piece. So that line behind their heads that kind of looks like, a, I guess, like a stock market kind of thing mm -hmm. behind them is actually, so they, Lazar's uh, town, and he was from Czechoslovakia, and she's from Hungary, and their town's kind of bordered. They were across a border from one another. And so she lived in Signet, which was the same town that Elie Wiesel lived in, but he, he wrote the book Night, that uh, he's like a Nobel Prize winning uh, author, who I think he recently passed away like three years ago who's also a survivor. But he talks about the liquidation of his town and she was from that town. And so she was 19 at the time, but he used to, Lazar used to go across the border to meet girls and he met Louise <laughs> in her town one time, like going across the border and everything. And then during the, the, they say everything kind of shook up during like World War II. Everything was kind of getting crazy. Lazar got sent to a workman's camp in Czechoslovakia and she got sent to Auschwitz and eventually to another camp to build um, airplane parts. And they found each other again after they both escaped towards the end of the war and found each other across that border, which is kind of interesting. Wow. And so I painted the border of Ukraine, of sorry, not Ukraine, of um, Hungary and Czechoslovakia within the back of the painting, kind of uh... represent that border that they had when they were, when they were dating. And I call it love and resist resilience because of kind of like, they found each other again after they had kind of dated. That's a really and I cool did, story. I did like a, a, my American Gothic kind of thing. You know what I mean? That kind of setup. 
Yeah. And I had the pleasure of seeing this one in person because as it says here that it is the Draper Prize winner in 2017 the International Portrait Competition, which I was there for oh, that. Yes. Yeah. So, and that was... I got it because that was, it was just my year. They've, they've, I've been in it so many times. They were just like, they wanted to kick me out. <laughs> yeah, whatever, man. You cleaned, you cleaned up that year. That was a great... That this painting was <laughs> mind is mind blowing. What did you end up doing with this painting? Where is it today? Uh, it got, it, it's in a private collection. Okay. It's weird. I don't actually even know because I haven't. My gallery hasn't told me where the paintings ended up. Oh, like again, I then I asked them about a year ago. I said, "Hey, can I get a list of where the paintings end up?" Because I'm in talks with another museum, actually two new two other museums that do shows, and they haven't gotten back to me isn't that funny they're all, of, they're very protective <laughs> their clients yeah um, i don't i don't it's 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 frustrating i'll i'll figure out i got an ip lawyer uh, i'll figure it out <laughs> yeah i hope you do okay so yeah. this is another one we'll look this at also yeah okay is there anything you can tell us about this painting elsa oh, ross the hidden child that, yeah so this is the only photo that she has of her of her with her parents that she's holding oh wow so, dude that's heavy this is cool like i know her with glasses now she always wears these big glasses that are kind of iconic and she also has a lot more color in what she wears and i feel like i've made her a little drab i love painting her hands though were so much fun i love painting hands because they're almost like portraits as you probably know you know mm -hmm. what i mean like the hands tell us so much about who we are and what we've done for a living you know mm -hmm. i have like these soft squishy hands because i'm an artist I don't build anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yeah, these, man, no one paints hands like you. I mean, again, to my point earlier, they're so real. Thanks, man. They go beyond, yeah, they, they, they look like they were painted from life, but they look like they took 2,000 hours from life, which... I mean, yeah, I, I, you know what? That's what I learned when I got out of school is kind of how do I get photography that I can, and we have all these tools now with Photoshop yeah. and raw format and apertures and everything. I print out like three or four different versions of what I want the lights and darks to be. So I can see what's going on in the dark. I can see what's going on in the light. And I kind of mix them. I mix those references up to be what it was with, with what's in front of me. What it used to be when I had like, when I could see everything that I wanted to see from the model from life yeah. in a photograph. Yeah, that's exactly. brilliant. So there were like limitations that I just couldn't afford models as much. Like I'm impressed that you paint everything from life. That's no, insane. not anymore. Amazing. Not anymore. COVID, I, with COVID, I started using photography again. So, okay. yeah, but I did for a while. Yeah, this is, this is amazing. Unbelievable. So where do I go to see some of your, um, your work yeah, like behind sure you. Okay, let me just kind of uh, float through here. Well, this is your father. I've seen this one in person too because it was in the, I think this was the one in the Hard Time uh, show. Was uh, it? Hard Time, maybe, maybe. Yeah. Oh, that was the one at the Salma Gundy Club? Yeah, yeah. Wasn't this one in it? I know it was of your dad. It's this, I think it was this one. That was like so long ago. It was a very remember. long time ago. This is an older piece. I remember this from early on when... I first discovered you. Um, yeah, this is an old piece that this was when I was in school. Yeah, this is Peter. He's always posed for us at the league. The head study of Peter. It's a little guy, fourteen by eighteen. Yeah, I know that one's in Spain. I think it got sold to a, a guy in Spain. Okay, so here's uh, Roberta Joy Casson. This is your mother, correct? Mom, um, yeah. Um, and this one is reminiscent of the work that I think I think of when I think of. David Casson, with you've got the figure up against um, some sort of a design abstract element. Usually it looks like a wall with graffiti on it, but not always. Um, yeah, yeah, tell me about I, this one. I love, I love like just um, it's like my on and off again relationship with my mom. It's a little obvious. Uh, the, the textures that I love though, like the textures I love this idea of making a background within a piece that where she could get out of the painting and the background would still be interesting enough to be an abstract painting. That it would be a texture of a wall that so you're giving abstraction a sense of realism by making it kind of reference tac like tactile feel of something that you have in reality. Right? So like a, a wall in Brooklyn, but has 
burn marks in it or, or things that dripped on it, but you have like letter forms that are more machined, stuff like that. So that's kind of where the backgrounds are kind of in. And again, if you look up David Carson's work, I don't know if you know his stuff mm -mm. at all. He did Ray Gun magazine in the 90s. Uh, I'm really influenced by David Carson and still am. And actually more so now than I think I used to be. Even though I've had all these things in my head, I'm going to start doing just backgrounds that are abstract, paintings that are just completely abstract. Kind of like what's behind me, but without the figure. Yeah. But. Like what I started doing now is cutting up magazines and collaging things. At that time, I used to go around the city and photograph every aspect that I would see of something really small, but blow it up. You know what I mean? Okay. Something that was stenciled and blow that up and put that into Photoshop and do Photoshop collage type stuff. Now I've been taking pieces of papers, paper magazines and everything and collaging them on a table, photographing with my iPhone, printing them out of the printer, ripping those apart crumpling those up so they have texture, putting that back down, adding more elements to it, photographing it again, making it digital, and then putting in the figure. That's how I work oh, on this background. Oh, that's slick. I like that. That's so a really creative mining, approach. Adding a lot of different elements. So like, here's the, you know, so this is like the comp for the piece. So this is just kind of like my matrix kind of idea of what the painting is going to be. And then I go in and, uh start to kind of block it all out and it's gonna areas are gonna be very similar to what i'm doing in this painting or i did in this painting where areas are going to fade in areas are going to lighten up it's not going to be as white as white and black it's going to have more atmosphere to it i mean she's going to have a shadow behind her you're going to you, the light here is you're blowing blowing out her feet and right this is for an exhibition that's going to be at the uh, maxwell alexander gallery they do a 10 10 year anniversary show and so this painting is 50 by 80 inches. Wow. And so uh, Shana's life size in it. And um, I'm glad she let me uh, paint her, which is awesome. Yeah, uh, that's going to be but beautiful. Yeah, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's been fun to kind of do full figure. People say I'm a portrait painter. And I'm always like, well, you know, I'm a painter with portraits in my paintings. <laughs> you know, but if I do like a small painting, like I try to do everything life size. I want to have a one-to-one -one conversation, like the viewer and the painting to have a conversation as if that person's in the same room as the sitter of the painting, the right. subject of the painting. Um, so that's hard if I'm, if I'm not doing paintings that are always 50 by 80 inches, you know what I mean, or four by eight feet or bigger stuff. So if I do a 16 by 20 inch painting, it's usually it'll be a head and shoulders, you know? Mm-hmm. So it's almost, you know, when you describe your process to me, it's almost like you get the abstract stuff together, either through collage or Photoshop or whatever you, your um, process is. And then you, you go into portrait painting mode and you do a portrait of the abstract in a way, which I find really yeah, interesting. I mean, it's, it's just a lot of texture. I love texture and tactile yeah. feels. For paintings, because I don't like, I don't like canvas so much because it looks like, I don't want them to look like paintings necessarily. Right. I want them to have almost a trompe l'oeil figure feel, but I want the same as I want, I want to be able to, I want a painting that you can pick off pieces of. You know what I mean? Like, you, I want you to feel like you could chip it with your fingernail. Yeah. And that's kind of what I mean. Happens. It feels like, okay, so there's yeah. an abstract painting that is completely uh, non-objective it's uh it's clearly just paint thrown on a canvas or or smushed around a canvas or whatever i'm oversimplifying abstract painting obviously but with yours i'm seeing something i feel like i could touch like like i could reach up and touch that wall it's uh yeah, it's, it's, it, there's an like objective that. quality to it it's it's not as subjective if that makes sense yeah i mean i think that well just I wanted to have like the sense of the real world, right. you know what I mean? Within, so I think abstraction can be just as real as as um, as real as in that. Maybe that's a controversial statement for people that might be dealing with. <laughs> yeah. but if you look at like a, a Rauschenberg painting, Rauschenberg's uh, paintings are collages. His combine paintings, especially, are like these collages of things that we find on the street and that we bring into the studio, and then you would paste them in designs. They were formalistic designs that were tactile like 
the things that we move through the world in. You know what I mean? We walk by these streets and these walls, then they're just as tactile as his paintings are. Yeah. You know, in a way that's more real than us trying to mimic reality through the paintbrush. You know, like if, if I were to paint the backgrounds trompe l'oeil, you wouldn't have that, that chip the paint off with your fingernail feel. You know what I mean? That kind of, if you're, you, if you're blind, and I'm not a huge fan of paintings that, are, that have no tactile feel to them. Oh, I love your work. You know, I love that you have that kind of meat to the paintings. Oh, thanks. I love that. I love that if I was blind, I could still feel the painting. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of the, the sound waves of a painting, where you'll have some areas that are acoustic and smooth, other areas that are rough and kind of distorted. You know, so that there's a way, like, think about just being able to rub your hand across a piece and you're like, okay, here's the figure. This is the woman's skin. Okay, yeah. Okay, now this is the background. You don't even need to see it to have that kind of uh, reaction, that tactile feel. And I think that we see that as a next level of, of realism, in quote, I hate that term, but whatever. Uh, not even realism. It's more just like human interaction with with a piece of art if we have that tactileness whereas um you don't get that if it's a perfectly smooth canvas you know it's like almost like that's just a dead heartbeat or you know what i mean there's mm -hmm. no heartbeat at all in a, in a piece like that to me you know yeah and i think that's also what makes um traditional media different i was going to say special but i don't i don't i don't want to necessarily put down anyone that's doing say digital media but there's something you know there's something incredibly beautiful just about the layers and the texture and the grittiness of oil paint right but if you and if you make yeah. it too thin it's just eh, well i don't know it just lacks something um no i mean i think that's why i'm again that's stuff that i love about antonio lopez's work you know what i mean there's that there's a, a patina to right. the actual painting also. So it's, uh, I've seen painters, I'm not gonna say any names, because I went up to Boston and saw the Antonio Lopez paintings. That, that you don't see these from photographs. You have to see the work in person. Always go see a painting in person. You, you, you can't get a sense of scale. Like that's why I hate um, people calling me a photorealist because they see it on a two inch by two inch screen on Instagram. Yeah. Oh my God, it's like a photo. And I'm like, and it's also on a smooth, non like it has no heartbeat you know like we're saying there's no tactileness really um oh just phone. just for the record though people have called people have said that to me too that's that's like that's like yeah, that's the go-to compliment for you're a great painter it looks just like a photo no totally and i think yeah. i think that's and i understand it I understand, that's how people yeah. judge things that are two-dimensional yeah because of the the camera it looks like a photograph right so i, I get it you know it's a it's a compliment it's when you get those people that say that it looks alive or that looks real, that's like, that's when I'm like endorphins hit. I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's right. It looks real. That's cool. That's what I want, you know? But um, with Antonio's stuff, it's crazy. It's just like there's cigarette burns in it, in the background, and everything's not as pristine, but it has that uh, patina of age to his paintings that just make them just feel like just heavier. You know, they feel weighty. I want my paintings to have a weight to them. I want my paintings that you look at them and you think that this thing weighs like as much as a car. No, know, that's interesting. Painting. I like that. You know, because yeah. we're building objects in a way. We're making an object. We're making something that's going to live way past us. You know, like the brush stroke lasts longer than the hand that made it, which is another thing I always think about when I paint is like, if I need to spend another year on this piece to make it exactly what I want to put out into the world, I'm going to do that versus rushing something to get it done to sell it. Like, that's why this poor painting, this poor collector is waiting for this other painting over here because I still want to work on it some more. You know, I'm going to probably put another two weeks into it, even though it's already sold and I've already spent all the money, you know, but I want to, it's, you're putting yourself out there in the best way that I can do it, you know? And so, but that idea of weight is, imagine that, okay, so what makes I think value for what we do is, is the weight of our thought, right? So this panel, that I'm working on, I've been working on this since November on and off. Sometimes I think I took like two, three months off to do some other pieces. I got to film another demo next week. So I'll take that time off from this, but you know, 
I don't like keeping track of the hours, but this is imagine like this this panel, this piece of ACM, a, a, a aluminum composite material, is soaking up every thought. I have about this painting, right? All the thoughts of the background, the transitions in my wife's skin, you know, her muscular structure that's happening under underground, under these areas, her hands, the subtlety of the movement of her of her profile in the piece. All of these thoughts are are being absorbed by this panel, and that's what's giving it weight. You know, all it's those answers to all those questions that we have. Is, it, is this too light or too dark? Is this transition? Is this a good transition or is this a bad transition? You know, all those emotional responses that we're having to our piece is being uh, encapsulated. It's being like kind of burned into this into the surface of the painting. And it's it makes it heavy. You know, I want it to have that weight. And I think that's what gives value, I think, to this experience that we're having. You know, it's capturing that experience. You know, you've probably gone and seen a painting that you did that you hadn't seen for 10 years and you're like, it transports you back to where you were when you painted that. At least my work does that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like listening to an old song. You know, a song does that for everybody, even if it's not a song you wrote. Uh, but with paintings, I think that that magic is in the, is, is luckily in the artist gets that vibe, you know, where you can go back and actually know exactly where you were when you painted something, you know, and what you were feeling. So like looking yeah. at these pieces that you're showing on the screen was kind of cool. I'm like, I remember painting my mom. Like, I remember what was going on there. Yeah. You know? That's, yeah, when you said that, that's what I thought about. I thought, well, you did, did, I don't know if you made up this quote, but it's brilliant. Um, where you said the, bra, the brush stroke lasts longer than the hand that painted it. Is that is that just something you just came up with? I don't with? remember who said it. Okay. I didn't come up with it. But No, no. I, I'm not that smart. <laughs> that's good. That's a good quote. But when you said that, I thought about this time that I walked into a collector's home and saw a painting that I remember I was pretty down on. I mean, you know, down on meaning it was as good as I could do. But like we talked about earlier, you always know you could do better, right? Eventually, if you keep working, you can do better. But then I yeah. saw it and all the little n things that bugged me when I was painting it, like, oh, that's my brush stroke. That's the way I paint a stroke. It's I'm so sick of seeing that. Um, then I looked at it again years later and was like, oh, this is so interesting. It was like I was uh, could step out of my own body and see it from another person's perspective and remember making those strokes. And then it, and it, it was, yeah, like you said, it's like taking you back. It was almost like a diary out of paint. Um, totally. Yeah, totally. it's kind of a cool thing. So I want to know... A little bit about more about your process. I'm going to pull your website back up here. Um, because since we are so different and I admire your work so much, this is self portrait with food poisoning. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> um, yeah, I had to finish that show at the league. Uh, it was like a probably the biggest show I was in. I said, Oh, can I do a self portrait? And they're like, Yeah. And I had to start it and everything. And then I got sick like two weeks before the show and, and I had to finish this piece. Yeah, that's... And uh, it's it's actually hanging in a collector's dining room, which is kind of weird. Oh, that's and ironic. Like, yeah. <laughs> With food know. poisoning. <laughs> yeah. That, that's was... funny. Yeah. Well, okay. So the question I have is, I know you work in layers because you often, I'll see you make a post or something and you'll be like, I've just got another layer to put on this or a few more layers to put on this. How, when you, when you do your initial lay in and then you go back on top of it, do you repaint the whole thing in, um, in order to put a fresh layer on top of it? Or are you sort of, um, not sporadically, but, um, just working on particular areas of need. And if you are working on particular areas of need, how do you blend the old into the new seamlessly? Yeah. Interesting. Um, it's weird. I'm a guy who doesn't like wet and wet painting all that much. Yeah. So I tend to, I start out, oh, it's crazy. I should send you a video. I mean, yeah, <laughs> I would, please I, do. I, teach, I talk a lot about this, but I just do um, very much. Um, if you go to, actually, there's a painting here. I think one of the first ones Okay. of Hannah, like, it's a study for a workshop. I can kind of show you guys that. Okay. Yeah. So Hannah that's Davidson. Hannah. So that was a, yeah. That was a, a demo painting. And so I start with a gray background. I redo the drawing. So I transfer the drawing that I did. I bring the drawing into Photoshop and I can size it any way I want. 
And then I just print that out and I, I put the back with pan pastel and I trace that down. And I use that kind of as the basis of the painting. And then, so I start out, I literally just block in the whole background, you know, just get a value in the background. And I start in on the shadows first. I want my shadows to be as smooth as possible without texture because I want that, that sense of depth. I don't want anything in the shadows to catch light from the room or from the gallery that kind of exceeds past the light of the actual uh, light halftone areas. I want the halftone areas to have the texture, kind of like Rembrandt kind of as yeah. type, thinner, you know, thinner, thinner darks, uh, thicker paint in the whites, in the lights and halftones. You know, and I really just kind of attack it from, it's ugly for a really long time <laughs> where I'm kind of like reshaping things in the darks. Again, using, a, I do use a small brush. I think about my darks kind of blocking those in, but then my lights are very much um, knitted together. So I'm always knitting my strokes together. Is it just like when I draw, my drawing method and my painting method are so similar. Uh, I think of the half tones and lights as being my white of my white charcoal. So when I do my charcoal drawings, I block everything in the pan pastel, which is like a, like a spatula to like a trowel shaped palette knife with a foam piece on it. And then I just knock everything in broadly. And then I come in and I'll start in on the light side because I also use a gray paper, you know, so I have my half tone already established. And so I'm just pulling my darks and my lights together. And so I work on a gray panel. This is on a gray panel. I work on other materials also, like um, I'm trying to think. I don't have it anymore so much. Oh, I work on mirror, mirror finishes. Oh, really? As well. Oh, wow. Yeah, like acrylic mirror is pretty awesome because there's a there's more of a depth for the shadows that you can huh. kind of see through the transparency of the shadows versus blocking off the, the top part of the mirror where the lights sit on top of it. So that looks like it's coming forward a little bit more. And so it, it's a way cool material to, to work with. But this was a demo for a workshop. Yeah, and I just, I kind of start from the middle and filter my way around. I don't stay in some pla in places too long, actually. So I don't, I don't sit and render an eye altogether and then go to the other eye and then to the nose and to the mouth. So I do kind of move sporadically around. And then, then I'm, everything's usually kind of hard edged and, and crappy. And then like, I see what's screaming at me the most to get fixed. And I kind of move along with those emotional responses to, to fixing edges and turning this form and, which you can do almost ad nauseum. You know what I mean? You can do it forever. <laughs> like I could still work on this painting more to get subtle subtler transitions and everything. So in building up layers of texture and I put the texture on towards the end where I, I use um, an ivory round brush that kind of uh, scoops up the paint. And then I kind of wiggle it a little bit with the texture to kind of get the areas that I feel in the lights that have a little bit of uh, mimicking what wrinkled skin looks like. You know, as opposed to, I guess it's pretty, pretty obvious though, I guess. I don't try to do anything that's not in service of the subject. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for me, I kind of want to take myself out of the painting equation for a lot of the pieces. I want them to be there. I don't want to see the, my hand all that much in the painting. You're going to see it in the, in the pose and, and in my certain handwriting that I always use. Like you're saying, you know, your own brushwork, right. You know, and how you go about things. I don't, I don't care if I'm, if I have that, if, as long as the subject is like number one, oh. you know, some people talk about this idea of like having emotion in the strokes and the dynamicism of whatever the pose is and all this stuff. And, and for me, the emotion is in the subtlety of the person that I'm painting. Okay. So, it as like there's three different aspects of a painting there's the artist there's the subject and then there's the viewer and i feel like you have your subject on one side you have your viewer on the other and you have the artist in the middle that made the piece right i want to get out of the way so that the viewer is looking just at the subject oh so that, that's a really with, interesting analogy especially with like survivors i want to paint them as honestly and authentically as i can I do fix some things in their faces. Sometimes a survivor, the symmetry on their face will be a little bit off. I, I adjust things a little bit 
but for the most part, I want them to speak to the viewer without me being there. So I'm not as concerned about my hand being in the piece as much as, as I am, as I wanna make them as breathing and living as possible and have as much blood in them as possible. And that, that's, a, that's a tall order that I'll never reach. Do you know what I mean? Having mm -hmm. like a living, breathing painting, you know, but that's, that's kind of, I'm not concerned, like, I'm not concerned with, I, my, I sign the back of my painting, I don't even sign the fronts, you know, because I don't want anything to be an illusion that get. and this is a demo, so it's kind of, everything's loose except for the face, you know what I mean? So I kind of did that, but for the most part, I want my pieces to be um, just, just them, you know? Hmm. Yeah, that's really, and it's so fascinating interviewing all these people because you might be the polar opposite of, of at least at least a couple of other people with that perspective which is interesting because um i'm only in, i'm only interviewing people i admire so <laughs> two people have completely different perspective on where the artist where, the artist place relative to the viewer and the subject and yet they're both amazing painters and both do incredible work and with that completely different perspective. It's really interesting. So I think of your, it's, it's almost like you're a documentary artist in a way. I mean, yeah, no, actually when I, when people ask me what I do, I, I do, I say I document people. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And, then, um, and that's also why I film them. Like they're just people I care about, you know, like my aunt, my mom, you know, my wife, like people in my life that I've cared about for the most part, you know? So yeah. there's an odd commission every now and then, but not as much. Yeah. I want to find your aunt. That That's one of my favorites. Your aunt that was laying on her side. Can I do one? Ah, right here. The, oh, okay. This one. There's other ones I think of her. If you go towards the back. Well, let me ask you like about this one first though. So yeah. while I'm not, obviously, you know what you're doing, right? And and I, I'm not disagreeing that you're, it does appear that the subject is the priority and the brushstroke is relatively trivial from your perspective. It's like, that's not what's, that was not what matters to you, I think is what you're saying. But. Well, if it helps describe like some type of texture or form. Right, but only I, to I, serve it, the it, subject, right? Yeah. That's what you're yeah. saying, right. I can't imagine me putting, why would you put in a, a brushstroke that's not, that doesn't serve the subject? Question for you. Would you do that? Okay. Yeah. That's a really, <laughs> uh, no. What's more important? What's more important? The subject or the artist? No, that, no, that's a good point though. But that, so that could lead to a whole different discussion because, but can't a brushstroke serve the serve the subject and still be something in and of itself. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting question. Oh. Like, so what? So, okay. So let's rephrase that then. So your main priority is just serving the subject and not, not having gla glitzy, fancy brushwork, right? Just it's about the subject. Documenting the subject is truthfully, and as authentically and as lifelike as possible, right? Yeah. Um, but your skin tones, your color choices, your compositions. Um, yeah, I'm in there. Yeah, yeah you're in there. Involved. So these yeah, are not. This is not just Aunt Dale. This is Aunt Dale behind, like through the lens well, no, of David Cassidy. Through my lens. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. Just yeah. not. Just not like, with like, the glitzy brush. Right? Yeah, I'm not like I don't want her bookshelf of her recent books that she's read. You know what I mean? Right, I like right. trying to take everything because uh, I don't I don't enjoy painting that stuff. You know, I used to. I used to paint street corners. I had everything under sun and depth and perspective and everything. I'm like, I just want to focus on the person. You know, but um, yeah. So, but where were you going with this? Sorry, I totally cut you off. And, and no, no, no. It's off. just that I and it's a compliment in a way. I mean, I guess it, I'm. I'm saying to you that that's a wonderful thing, like to, that you're documenting these things so authentically and that you, you know, your brushstrokes aren't, it, that's not about the brushstroke, but at the same time, it is going through your lens because you as the designer, as the, as the creator of the concept, 
and even as choosing yeah. choosing subtle color variations and edge variations in order to um, make this painting as interesting as possible and as lifelike as possible still makes it um, more than just a, an absolute truthful documentation. Oh, totally, totally. And, and I guess it would be just, a, it would just be a photo, well, not even a photograph. Well, because uh, there's human decisions that are made. Right, right. Definitely. And and like I said, my handwriting is all over it. And my background is my handwriting is in the painting behind me. You know, it's stuff that I want to say as well as the subject, right. you know, and combine the two. And so there's definitely a, there's a contrast there. You know, there's a contrast in everything. When I when I combine abstraction with the with, I guess the, the figures, there's that contrast of abstract, real, flat, you know, volumetric. There's color versus not color. You know what I mean? So right. I try to combine a lot of different things that are disparate elements and, and shove them together into the same world. You know, and that gives me pleasure. And that's where my art, my quote unquote artistry comes in. That's where my, that's my fancy brushstroke. You know, that's the stuff that challenges me. That I, I'm like holistically thinking of an entire piece rather than something that's a smaller part of it, I guess. So maybe I'm a director of a piece as opposed to maybe, yeah, I'm not the actor, you know? Yeah, yeah, that I like that. So the other question I have about this is how much do you feel you have to know about anatomy to create a figure that is so unbelievably anatomically convincing? Yeah. Okay. So I think that's a really, that's a great question. I think that, so I, I had a anatomy lab classes when I was at Syracuse university and I studied with this great painter. Oh my God. Like the best painter ever, uh, Jerome Whitkin. I don't know if you know his stuff. Mm -mm. Everyone should go run to the internet and look up Jerome Whitkin. And he was a huge influence on me, even though I only studied with him, I think in, I had two classes with him only, but he was so influential. Uh, he was in the fine art department of the of the school, and I was in the illustration department. Um, I think there's different aspects of anatomy, though. I think that there's perceptual, and then there's like knowledge. Like perceptual is kind of like what it is that we see that's in front of us, right? Versus sometimes if you know too much and you don't see it, you enforce your knowledge over top of it, and so you make it. I feel like Aikens did that a lot sometimes where they were, he almost enforces anatomy knowledge over top of the subject where something could have been a little bit more perceptual and it would have looked more real than, than describing every aspect of like the alar cartilage on the nose of someone singing. You mm -hmm. know, I feel like that can kind of get in the way. So I think that there's, there's a, there's a great, um, <laughs> it's a, there's a benefit, I think, in not knowing everything about anatomy where you can kind of go with what you think you would see if this person was in real life versus everything's described because I know everything, you know, like I know where every tendon is when I don't, you know, I think of it in terms of, of perceptual where like, you know, like what does, how do resting tension lines, how are wrinkles created on the skin? What's the science behind that? And how does that flow across the body? And so we know that, like, if you're, you have muscles, like your tendons of your fingers, right, go lengthwise, the wrinkles are caused, are, they go perpendicular to how the tendons are. That's how everything is on your horses oculi in your eye, right? That's why wrinkles go across the racetrack, essentially, of the muscle that's used to open and close your eyes over a long time, period of time. So that's how those wrinkles are created. And so there's an understanding of within facial anatomy, you know, of like, I don't think you need to know all the Latin terms or the insertions or like all those aspects, but to understand that everything is connected and woven together underneath the skin. And that's what kind of gives us a rhythm to the, to the face and facial expressions and subtlety that I think it's amazing. And, and it's stuff that you can see, you know, that you can feel. I don't know if you need to study it so in depth that it takes over, you know, because there's that idea of you, if you know too much, you should paint what you see versus what you know. And you've heard that a hundred times, yeah. you know, and you've probably told your students that a lot. You're like, no, you, I know you know what's going on here, but you're overemphasizing that. Do you see it that way? You know, what is it in real life? And then when you start having things again, that are kind of axioms, Right, where this proportion is from here to here, this proportion is from here. It's every chapter of every anatomy book talks about that. Like, 
you have like, but there are these heroic portions that don't fit everybody. Mm -hmm. If there's a way that you can learn it all, you erase that from your memory. But then when you come across it in real life, then you can put it to it. You know, it's like that idea, like site size doesn't work all the time. You know, it's not going to work if you're at a museum and you're studying a painting or you see someone on the subway. You can't site size them as you draw them. You know, you, you need to triangulate. You need to think about aspects of site size, but then also how does, how does this area relate to this area mm -hmm. within proportions? So everything is kind of a, what would this work like? What would this be in the real world versus like what George Bridgman would do? You know, George Bridgman, he would draw a figure that looked like a George Bridgman anatomy you know, constructed, like he would construct a, a figure, you know, is that lifelike? Is that exactly like, the, again, is that the subject or is that Bridgman putting his filter over top of the subject? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, I don't know a lot about anatomy. I mean, I used to write an article or art or drawing magazine quarterly about anatomy where it was like, today we're doing the feet. Now we're doing lips. Like, oh, now we know the thinness of the lips and how there's no edges really. It's just thin skin that's more vascular. And so understanding the science behind things and about the face is really amazing, you know, and, and things that are behind the body. And I could, I mean, I have so much more to learn about all that stuff, you know, mm -hmm. but um, uh, I think it's, you could just trust your eyes also at the same time. Yeah. Okay. So in summary, I think you want to forget. in summary, you're saying <laughs> you don't need it, but a little bit of knowledge might be helpful. Is what I think, I think is what any you're knowledge saying. is helpful. Yeah. I think any knowledge is helpful, but I think that don't be afraid to, to let go of it. Right. And, and think of things just perceptually. Mm -hmm. Perceptually is being like, it is what it is. You know, that value is that value. You don't have to, not everything has to be um, described anatomy wise. Yeah. That's, I, I like that perspective. Yeah. I've started learning anatomy over the past few years. And I don't know it terribly well either, but I know it a lot better than I did a few years ago. Um, and it, is, it takes discipline to not think too much about what you've learned and to just see, you know? So you're right. I think sometimes having a little too much knowledge, you have to be able to rein it in. You have to keep it under control, not decorate with it. Um, so you had mentioned earlier, there are some other paintings that we should look at. Um, yeah, I'm not sure at the very end. I mean, that's kind of a, is that the very end? Oh, that's I think there's the, two other there's dots. There's two more. Yeah. I, don't know, I wonder if that's. Oh, that's your focuses. demo video, which by the way, um, that concept that you talked about earlier, where you filmed her whole life and her as a person while you did the demo video, that was brilliant. That was a great video. I own that. Great video. Thanks. Um, so what, yeah. Is there oh, any particular good. that you'd like to talk about? Maybe keep going. Let me see if there's anything cool. This is all old stuff. This is like uh, history. It's like I'm giving My you history. a tour of your own website right now. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. Okay, that's an older piece. I don't really like that one either. That's okay. That's all based on a on a yeah. So yeah, we're just flipping through. Oh, I love that one. You do you do you like that one? Yeah, it's okay. That's in the garage, I think. See, you love your work, but you're still critical of it. Yeah. This that's uh yeah, I like that piece. That was a really that was a banner piece because I started using more texture. Yeah. Well, crazy. so here on this one, this is head study of Peter. We we already talked about this a little bit, but in this one, yeah, you um you are using some more lively brushwork down here in the chest to suggest chest hair. It looks like is what you're doing. Yeah, it's it's like I was using bristle brushes to kind of really, and I was I was, and I do that actually in the self portrait too in the forehead, but a little bit more mild. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I actually love like texture and skin, unless it's like someone who's like a younger younger skin is usually more pliable, flexible, thinner, like less wrinkles. Right. Resting tension lines. All them. That's like the nice way to say wrinkle. Um. Okay. And my dad. So I use a, I love some texture one. in there to kind of hit the light certain ways. Is your father you know, still yeah. still alive? No, no. Unfortunately, he passed away like five years ago. Okay. Yeah. And how do your parents feel about their portraits when you've painted them? Um. Yeah. I don't. I don't think they like them at all. Oh, really? <laughs> they don't. 
Yeah, they really, um, yeah, I think they were happy I could make a living, but they didn't really love my work. Oh, I no. <laughs> oh, no. That's tough. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. I well, think my dad, my dad was very, uh, he was in the military for 22 years. So he's very much about, he just wanted his kids. He had three boys, uh, two older brothers. And just for us to be self-sufficient yeah. in the world was like his goal. You know, he didn't care what we did. Uh, he didn't care if he, we loved what we did or what we do. Um, just as long as you're able to make a living and, and um, support your own kids, you know what I mean? Kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you're good. Then he did his job well. Because he his father left when he was fifteen, my dad. So he kind of grew up without having that security. Kind of thing. Oh so wow! He wanted, this. yeah. Okay, well, I'd like to also look at your drawings. Ex there's Aunt Dale right there. Oh, that's, that's her again. Yes, yeah, so that's an older piece. That's a beautiful it's piece. Nice. And look at the, the collector veins, who... the veins and stuff in her arms. <laughs> Jeez, man. It looks so lifelike. Uh, I could do it so much better now. Anyway. Yeah. Oh, man, <laughs> that's also, depressing. I think, also, I think the camera work, like a camera from 2009 versus cameras now, like this piece, I think, is in Florida in a collection in Florida. And I can't, I don't know, I can't get it back to photograph it. So like, I'm, I feel like a lot of the older stuff I have, you lose the colors that you have in the newer stuff because I can get a better photo now. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that. I, I have, have older photos of people in 2003, 2004 that are just like, I don't know, like the resolution's horrible because digital photography back then was really bad. Yeah. Well, not to mention your references are so much better now. You can take great reference with your cell phone now. It's insane. Oh, it's true. That's All right. True. Let's look at your drawings because, you know, one of the things I noticed about you first was I, I remember... It was probably after I'd been introduced to you, but I was probably stalking you on YouTube or something. And I saw you do these really cool demonstration drawings on YouTube. And I was just like, man, this guy can draw. You've got some really, really strong drawing skills. Um, and you've already talked a little I'm bit about that process. About Are you really? <laughs> Why? What is it about I mean, your yeah, drawing that I'm you're insecure thinking, about? Um, um, no, it's just something that I remember when I couldn't draw anything. And I was just really bad, you know, wow. and just, uh, had to, it's something I've had to work on, you know, which is not a hard thing, not a bad thing to work on. You're sitting there drawing, you know, it's fun. But I remember like, uh, well, I, I think I was, I kind of took naturally to charcoal when I was in college or when I was in high school, cause I started drawing from life when I was 15. Mm -hmm. But then, um, illustration kind of put that back a little bit. I remember when I first got into the Art Students League and everybody could draw so well. And I think that's the thing is like working from life with people that have been in that classroom for 20 years plus, they were just, they draw like a dream. You know what I mean? It's like kind of like, I got to catch up, you know, and then five, six years later, so I still haven't caught up because <laughs> they just get better. You know what I mean? So yeah. I think that that kind of leads to a point where like, I got to get a lot better. And so I think that maybe that kind of insecurity kind of stuck with me, which is fine. You know, well, the rest of us can't see it. It's it's um, unbelievable. Um, oh, I wanted to see that little baby. I love this little drawing. Oh, so that that's my uh, my son. I drew him. So again, that idea of experiences. I drew him uh, when uh, he was three months old. And it's a it's a small little drawing. And he's what seventeen now? How old is he now? Sixteen. Sixteen. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a, that's. And he's a taller than me, and <laughs> he's got two inches on me, which isn't hard actually. <laughs> I'm only five one. No. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're like five nine, aren't you? Like five nine. Yeah, something like that. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Shane is laughing. Shane <laughs> heard that. Shane is, Shane is six foot. <laughs> All right, here's another one that's beautiful, Laura. Uh, charcoal on tone paper, 2009. Gorgeous. Yeah, she was a she was a model we had in Portugal. I used to teach all. I used to do teaching in Faro, Portugal. I'd go there a couple times a year, and uh, she was one of the models. Yeah. So one of the things so I want to ask you about good. with these drawings is one thing I noticed is that you would you would draw 
get the basic structure down. Uh, you would start to describe the forms, then you'd soften the whole thing um, with like, uh, I can't remember. I feel like it was like a brush or something. Paper towel. A paper, a towel? paper towel. Okay. And well, then, in the beginning it was a paper towel. Then I moved to soft brushes kind of like to merge areas, right. swoosh an area a little bit. And then you'd come back in and start tightening back up and, and hardening edges back up again. And I thought that it, it really, it creates this beautiful soft quality that you have to your drawings. I mean, you create Thanks. the beautiful soft quality, but when I saw that, that process, I, it just seemed like so common sense once I saw you doing that. But do you, do you implement that in your paintings as well? Do you get your paintings kind of structurally sound and then brush them down? Well, no, no, actually it's funny. I had a, a, a mentor, yeah. uh, some artists every now and then on, on Zoom or whatever. And uh, he was asking me that same question, the, the student. Like in, when, I was in, when I was in school, I had a teacher that would have us all have these giant hockey brushes, H-A-K-E mm -hmm. uh, -E, uh, brushes. that are like goat hair or something like that, like really soft or maybe, I don't know what it is, just super soft brush that you would paint stuff like broadly. And then you take this brush and just, soften the entire thing and then you go into that and then you work. Um, I had the hardest time ever using that technique though, because it was all about color patches, like large color patches and something for me that didn't fit my temperament at all. It does when it comes to drawing though. So when I draw, I think of it in large mass patches. And then when I transfer that drawing over, then I go right into kind of under understanding the form because I already have the drawing already established and the proportions for the most part. You know, the drawings get a little bit more uh, detail, detailed or whatever, or more understood. I always say that a painting, the more you work on a painting, at least what I do, it's I'm putting more understanding into the painting. So I'll sit there and I'll work on a painting for hands for like a month. And I remember I, I was working on my mom, a painting of my mom, and I was painting her hands. And someone was like, you know, they look done. Are you done with the, the hands? I'm like, I guess it could be done. The message has already been sent. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need to work on these hands more, but I was enjoying painting the hands, you know, especially my mom's hands. I, they're like the hands that hold you when you're young. So you can have these kind of um, those memories, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of come back to you. And so I really wanted to do them well. But that the drawing up aspect of that is all just blocking in those large shapes and then smooshing, I guess, or blending. Um, also, with charcoal, I tend to, I, I want to push the charcoal into the paper so that it kind of builds a nice uh, base to actually go over top of it with the white chalk, so that the white chalk can can blend nicely with the charcoal. And so I think that kind of fits together. With oil paint, it's like a totally different kind of thing. I think of the oil paint, like my brush with the paint as being the white chalk pencil, kind of describing form through knitting of different kind of aspects of broken color, like having broken color and broken color, so it's like a tapestry of color that's built up. So you'll have greens next to pinks, you know, where they can vibrate. Yeah. You can see in some Rembrandt paintings that are so living, you see that pink scumble over that green underpainting, and you're just like, you know, like, that looks so alive. Mm -hmm. Like, how do I get that in my work, but in my own handwriting, you know? Hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's kind of incredible. I ramble a lot. I ramble a lot. <laughs> no, no, you're, this is great. That, that's cool that you figured out, because you paint nothing like Rembrandt. Um, um, no. and yet you figured out a way to implement some of his, uh, tricks. I don't know for lack of a better term, some of his devices that he uses to create beautiful translucent flesh. You figured out a way to implement it with your own signature and your own temperament. That's well, I think a guy that's really good at, I studied with Steve at sale and he kind of, so he uses that, um, uses his fan brushes, right? So right. he rakes these lines of broken color on top of each other. And right. so it builds up this jewel-like surface that you can see he paints differently than Rembrandt, but more broadly in form, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I studied with him and I was like, I'll never be able to use a, a raking stroke like that, but I could do this with a smaller brush, a little bit more controlled, a little bit more in my temperament uh, and be my own artist, but kind of take that ingredient of what I love about what Stephen Assail does and maybe put that into what I do, you know, maybe. It's yeah. a, I don't get nearly as much glow as what he does, you know, and he's, he's amazing. He's an amazing guy. Oh, he's unbelievable. I didn't realize you studied with him. 
Yeah, he's unbelievable. Just 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 workshops. I, I monitored okay. for him at the league. We would teach at the league and stuff. And yeah. he's pretty cool. It's funny. I saw him once. I was flying back from New York to Albuquerque, and I was waiting. It's like a JetBlue flight, and I was at the gate, and I saw him at the gate, and he was flying to Albuquerque. A friend of his like lives out here, uh, who they studied together in high school or something, hmm. and. Um, I talked with him the entire flight in the back of the plane, just standing up talking. It was oh, awesome. really? Oh, awesome. Yeah, he couldn't get away from me because the plane was small. <laughs> he couldn't escape. Stalker. He tried. He tried. <laughs> That's I funny. with questions. <laughs> All right. So, so yeah. we're getting pretty close to, um, we're probably well over 90 minutes, actually. But I got one more question for you. Um, what advice would you give to somebody an aspiring artist who admires your work and wants to do, wants to become a, a painter. I mean, I'm trying to think what, I, what would I tell myself when I was a kid? You know what I mean? Like 20 years ago about it. I think it's, I think there's different paths you can take as an artist. I think that, um, understanding that early on you want to, there, so there's a Robert Henry, Henry quote that I think is amazing. It's, it's, I want to, be an art, I want to be an artist to be an artist and not make a living as an artist or butchering the quote. <laughs> it's like this idea of, um, I want to be an artist not to make money, but I want to be an artist to be an artist, you know? So I think that um, the way to purity of work is to not necessarily just focus on making money as an artist. You know, I think it's making a living as an artist. Anyway, you want to think of, I mean, I, and in you and all these other artists that you're interviewing, I'm sure they just first and foremost think of themselves as an artist, that they're trying to get out what their heart and soul is onto a canvas in the most pure way possible. You know, there's no, no um, that's what you want to hold on to. And you also want to hold on to what it was like when you first saw paintings. For me, when I was 15 years old, going to the Philadelphia Art Museum, it wasn't about, is that your painted perfectly? or is that light hitting that table beautifully? How was that painted or, or whatever? It was about this arrangement of colors that I just fell in love with. It was this idea of there was a naive vision that made me want to be an artist, wanted me to be a part of this tradition. And I think that's something to hold on to. Even 20 years later, I think about what is it that I loved about the, the Marc Chagall paintings I saw. You know, he painted a goat in here and the heads purple or that is, you know, like the, there's a violin, but his head's upside down and his face is green. Just love that arrangement of color and the tactileness of the painting. Some things just aren't rational that we fall in love with, you know, and then hold on to that kind of irrational love of being an artist. And that'll carry you through, you know, because I think sometimes we spend too much time with the technical aspects and we forget about the heart and the purpose of why we did this in the beginning. You know, I think that technical stuff can be can be can be fought for. And that's kind of a that's kind of an easy way, the easy thing. Like we know when an ear looks good. And we can look up how Bugaro painted an ear or how Sargent painted an ear and what direction you want to go that way. But I think that what is it that's going to make you different is kind of what brought you to this place in the beginning. Oh yeah, that's brilliant. That's great advice. Well this was a really great conversation. I totally butchered that quote. <laughs> totally butchered that. Did you? Well, hey, it was still meaningful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank This has been a great conversation, David. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, uh, fun. yeah thanks for being on the show. Dude, it's a huge honor, you know, because I love all these artists that you're showing, and it's pretty pretty awesome to be included. It's cool. Thanks. <laughs> all right, take care. All the cool kids. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks for tuning in to the Undraped Artist Podcast. If you enjoyed it, subscribe. And if you could, leave a comment or review. That really helps the channel. Please share the show with your friends. And if you're feeling generous, consider a monthly donation at theundrapedartist.com. Thanks again for watching. We'll see you next week.